growing our skills in pastoral care, in pastoral counsel, and in our everyday conversations. I, I'm going to ask you certain things uh, throughout the day and, and, and have you think first of yourself and then the way you care for other people. Because one of the privileges of pastoral care, it's, it's not so much a technology that once we learn the technology, we can just disperse it to other people. It is, it is something where we have been changed by the Spirit and the Word, and we, we give that to others. So as a result, a lot of the things I'll be doing today will be asking you questions and speaking about you. And, and you'll be thinking of yourself and the issues in your own life, and then you'll be turning to, to think of, of other people. So here's a question I would li like to ask you first. How do you want to grow? How do you want to grow in your pastoral care and counsel and your everyday conversations? It, it's, it's curious, when you, if, if you go to a Bible college or a seminary, they will oftentimes have classes on your skill in public ministry, in preaching and teaching, but they will never have courses on your everyday conversations. How can we grow in our everyday conversations, which is gonna be where the vast time of our ministry is directed? So, question. Uh, your own self-assessment. How do you want to grow in your pastoral care and counsel. And let me just, just raise a, a few different categories as, as you're thinking, how do you want to grow? It's, it's going to be challenging for us to grow if we don't have any ideas of weaknesses and places where we want to grow. So for example, if I would ask my wife this question, and maybe I will ask my wife this question, uh, uh, I think she would say that I can grow in pursuing people. I can grow in pursuing people. Uh, this, don't forget, what we're talking about are conversations that are not simply people coming to you. Most of your pastoral care is going to be you moving toward them. So how do you do in taking the initiative toward others, and, and you're especially looking for the quieter ones, the ones who seem alone, the ones who seem just a bit more downcast, the ones you don't know. What do you do in, in pursuing those? Now then the question is, how do you do once you pursue them, then what do you say? <laughs> That's, <laughs> that, can be a, that can be a challenging question. But I'm just, I'm just giving you an opportunity to think, what are areas where you want to grow? And, and, and sure, I might ask, you don't have to say anything, but I might ask you in just, just a couple minutes if you have any other thoughts, where, where do you think I need to grow as you observe me with other people and with you? So you don't have to say anything, but I would like to, I would like to hear your more current thoughts on it. So. Um, Second category, in your conversations, are you able to move conversations to things that are especially important? Are you able to move conversations to things that are especially important? Now, there, there might be, I, at least I've noticed a gender distinction between this, where, where for men, it's, it's that first step of what's important. It, it's, it's moving past the, the sports of the day, uh, moving, and, 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 and what, is, what is on a man's heart? Uh, you know, for them to, you know, they speak about their activities, they, you know, they speak about things that are happening at work, but how can you move them to those things that are most important? They're, and, and, and we'll get into this a little bit later, what, would, what do we even mean by important? Well, the first level would probably be the things that are their joys or the things that are their sorrows. That would be, that, that, that's not the bottom 
of, 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 of moving into the heart, but that is at least an initial way to, to move into somebody's heart. How do you do, men, in, in moving toward those things that are important, or as the scripture might, might identify, how do you do in sort of drawing out the water of the well of the person's heart? The, 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 the nature of the human heart is that it tends to be covered and it tends to be deep, and it doesn't necessarily come out naturally. How do you do in inviting the person to speak from their heart? With women, the, uh, uh, that seems to happen more naturally in conversations, where, where women are a little bit more willing. You say, how are you? And to, uh, a woman speaking to another woman, and a woman is oftentimes willing to share the joys and sorrows fairly readily. And then the question is, how do we move even farther to be able to take those joys and sorrows in a meaningful way to the scripture and to the person of Christ? So what I'm doing right now is I'm simply asking, where do you want to grow in your pastoral skills? in your counseling skills, in your everyday conversation skills. Here's another way to ask the question. What, what has been helpful for you in the way you have been cared for by others? Are you growing in such things? For example, I. What has been helpful for me is when somebody, when somebody asks, how are you? Essentially, they can even ask the simple question, what's been important in your life? And, and I begin to venture, here's, here's what's been important in my life. And the person responds with what's been important in their life. Now, you, you understand what I'm saying there, that, that, that that's natural in most of our conversations. Um, it's, you, know, you speak about your children, I speak about my children. <laughs> How are your kids? Okay, well, let me tell you about my kids. It, again, it's ordinary in conversation, but it is probably not a helpful way to, to care for another person. Because, for example, if, if I talk about a particular challenge that I might be having with my children or my grandchildren, and you respond with a similar challenge that you have with your grandchildren or your children, I am probably not going to talk anymore about what my struggle is. Because you see what I'm saying? Because, because, because you didn't invite me. <laughs> you, you, my words became an occasion for you to speak about things in your own life. Now, it happens all the time. And it's not necessarily wrong. I'm not suggesting it's wrong at all. I'm suggesting that most of us have probably seen how it has not been helpful for us if we have something sensitive to share with another person. If, if they ask, but then they immediately begin speaking about a similar phenomenon in their own life, chances are we are not going to speak these things. How are you growing in your pastoral care and counsel? And maybe a relevant question here would be, how are you growing in those areas where we can feel especially inadequate? When people are struggling with psychiatric problems, for example, how are you growing in your care to, to those who are under psychiatric care? How are you growing in, in your care for those who seem to struggle with different kinds of addictions? The, 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 the more obvious, dangerous ones, drugs and alcohol. The, the less obvious ones, pornography. The less obvious ones, people involved in gaming for four or five or 10 hours a day or whatever it might be. This is, I'll leave this as a rhetorical question. How many of you have ever been helped by advice? I, I've been helped by advice when I've asked for advice. But even then, when I ask for advice, I, whether it's, it's what kind of car should I buy, 
Or how should I parent my child in this situation? Uh, my experience in asking for advice is that if I go to 10 people, I will get 10 different types of advice, which, I, which confuses me because I assume that if I would ask advice, somehow the spirit would, would take all those voices and converge them, and the answer would be obvious. Well, I think the spirit still does use those times where we ask for advice from others, but it, it's, it simply pleases God for us to have the humility to ask. And that's part of the process where he guides us. So, so even when you ask for advice, lots of times you're going to get an answer, which is not the answer that you're going to do because there's so many different perspectives that people can have. Most of us have probably not been helped by advice. I'll, I'll use the simple illustration of parenting. Oh, here's, here's what my daughter is doing, a rebellious teenager, whatever it might be. Uh, advice is typically, this is what I would do if I was in your situation. Or this is what I think you should do. Uh, well, it, it, it's not listening. See, a different way of approach would be, well, what have you done? I have a rebellious daughter. What have you done? What has been helpful? You see how it moves us in the same direction, but it's not, at, it's, it's not giving advice. Most of us, when we encounter somebody who gives advice, we will simply not share our hearts with them the next time around. We'll go to somebody who listens. So, so how do we grow in listening, which that, that responsive engagement to another person? Let me just give you, give you one other illustration. I don't want to belabor this, but two pastors that, that I knew well. One, you give them five minutes. One would, would listen to you for, for two and give advice for three. The other one would listen to you for two or three or four minutes and then pray for you for, for the next minute or two. And it was fascinating to me to, to watch how, how these two pastors, the, the numbers of people who spoke with them over the years, the one who gave advice quickly, even though it was sound advice, the people simply stopped coming to him. Where more and more came to the one who, who he wasn't dispensing the advice, he was simply saying, we know where to turn. And sometimes he would ask that question, how, how can we pray together? So the first thing I'd like you to do is, is be thinking at least one area where you want to grow. Okay, now let's, let me move into a few, a few specifics. And, and the specifics of how we grow, I'm going to offer them as, as little pieces of theology. Because all, we, are, we are people where everything we do, we want it to be grounded in Scripture. We want there to be scriptural reasons for it. So, so I'm going to go through perhaps a handful of different pieces of theology. Some of it resides in your outline. Not all of it does, though. And, and here's a place to begin. It's, it, it's an answer to the question, really, who are you? And, and the question, and that will be the prominent question I ask whenever we go to the scripture for the next, at least the next hour or so. Who are you? Well, here's, here's a way we can grow. You are a person who needs help. That's who you are. You need help. If, if you think that all wisdom resides in you, then, then, then you need to grow because, because it doesn't reside in you. You're someone who needs help. And that doesn't mean that everybody you're speaking to, you're asking them for help. It, it is, but it does it does create a fundamental posture of humility before God and before other people. Faith, which is our primary response to the Lord, is basically saying we need help. We are not adequate in ourselves. We're not adequate to save our souls. We're not adequate to manage one hour of our lives. 
We need help. Are you growing in that? Are you growing in, in that kind of neediness? The, some of the heroes who, who are before us, among those heroes, one of the more prominent heroes would be Luke chapter 18, the tax collector. Here is the one we want to emulate. The one who, who felt like he couldn't even go to the temple grounds, but, but stood at a distance and couldn't even look up to heaven, looked down on the earth and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's, that's who we want to be. Uh, a person who needs our God moment after moment, day after day. And as we need our God, we're going to be, we're going to be open in needing other people as well. So, who are you? You are, you are someone who needs help. Let me continue with that. Who are you? You are, if the Apostle Paul answers that question, you, you are a weak person. As you help others, you help them out of your weakness. And I'm especially thinking about the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians now, where, where the Apostle Paul, it's among the, 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 the dramas in his own life, it seems as though one of them was, now that we have the Spirit, we have, we have the very power and wisdom and the mysteries of godliness and God himself. And why is it that I feel so weak? Why is it that I feel so inadequate? That was, that was a question that, 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 who knows how long the question persisted. But he finally was led, and we see this in, in, in 2 Corinthians, we finally see that he was led in, hold it, hold, hold. Jesus was crucified in weakness, and he was raised in power. We expect the same path, that we it, we, will, we will grow in weakness. Another word for weakness could be inadequacy. I am not able to do these things. I can't, I, I can't do what God has given me to do today. It's over my head. It's, it's too much for me. I feel inadequate in the midst of it. That is the normal Christian life. And, and, and can you see, if we, if we do not feel inadequate, then then we feel like we can manage the problems of other people. You go through this step and this step and this step and everything will be fine. Well, all of a sudden, pastoral care, the essence of pastoral care will not be that we pray for another person and even ask them to pray for ourselves. Indeed, who are you? You're a person who has all kinds of strengths. You have struggles with different kinds of sins and and you're seeking to turn to Christ in the midst of those sins. But, but you are inadequate. You are adequate, inadequate in yourself. And the way you go, you, you go through life is you should feel weak and needy. And, and you ask for grace day after day. It, it looks like prayerfulness with another person. It looks like, let's, let's consider this together. You see the difference? It's, 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 it's instead, I know exactly what you need to do to, to let's consider this matter together. Let's think about this. Let's pray about this. Let's consider what scripture has to say about this. Who would have thought that that your own inadequacy would be, would be something you aspire to. Uh, so if you're feeling strong, if you feel like you know what's going on in your pastoral care opportunities, then one of the places you need to grow is you need to grow in feeling more inadequate. And it's in that inadequacy that, that the Lord seems, seems pleased to, to do his most dramatic work. I would say as a professional counselor, those have been the best times as a professional counselor where, where I, did not I did not have a clue what to do. And, 
and those are the times I pray more. I pray more for the other person, for me, as, as, we go, as we go through our time together. Those are the times I'll stop in the middle of a counseling time and say, these are very difficult things you're speaking of. These are beyond us. Let's pray. Let's, let's take time to pray. Is it any wonder that, that those are the times where the power of God seems especially evident? So, we want to grow as skillful pastoral counselors. We want to grow in our pastoral care. And it's a curious way to begin, but one way to begin is, are you feeling good and inadequate? A second, who are you? Who are you? How, the, the question there is, how have you grown and changed in your own life? What has been helpful for you? And I think there's just really one thing that I want to identify here, and it's a theology of, of sanctification, but it's a theology of progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification is, it, 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 it's, it says this, this is the way that you grow. You, you come to Christ, which means that you have been turned. You have been turned from your idols. You've been turned from your self-sufficiency. And you've been turned to Christ. That's conversion. And, and then we walk toward Christ. And, and with Christ by the Spirit. But in the midst of that walk, what happens? We, we get diverted. We, we, our, our, the worries of the day can, can divert us. And, and, and we move to trying to make the world work in our own ways. We, we have suffering in our lives, and we, we become very slow to turn to our God who hears in our suffering. Or we're struggling with different sins in our lives. And, and we indulge our sins rather than turn to him. The Christian life is, we hear the Lord say to us, turn, turn. And, and this is not the turn of conversion. It's the, turn, it's the turn of sanctification. It's the turn of repentance. I'm, beginning, I'm answering the question, how do you grow? And I'm, I'm suggesting this is the way that you grow. So, and, and, the, and the question is, what is your theology of sanctification that undergirds your understanding of how the person in front of you is going to grow? It's not going to be like a light switch where they were dead and now they're, now they're fully alive and off they go. It's, it's they turn and then they turn away, and then they turn again, and they turn for longer, and then they get sidetracked. <laughs> they get sidetracked by, by sufferings, by, by different old sin patterns, and then they turn again. It's, sanctification is this jagged line of, of growth. It's, you can see the good and the bad in every human heart at any particular moment. Now, what that does for us is, 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 is it takes the way the question of, 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 in a sense, it takes the way the, the question of Christian maturity. How far down the road are you? How much have you grown in Christ? And the, and the, the question is more, are you turning to Jesus? What direction are you walking in? It's not so much a question of how far you've walked in that direction. Uh, it's... It's, are you facing the right direction? And, and can you see how in, in, in the midst of, it, this is one of the benefits of, of this little bit of theology is that you're almost always able to see the good in another person. Now, all, of, all of us are sinners. All of us are sinners. But, but a theology of progressive sanctification is saying that in the midst of our sinfulness and our struggle with sin and our stubbornness in trying to solve life our own way, 
there is still that movement back to Christ. Let me, for example, I, I can think of a, a teenager who was uh, using cocaine. And, and of course, like any, like any teenager who's using drugs, he keeps it quiet. And the, the reason he was talking to me, it was he was, he was found out by, by people in his school. And so, so you know, we, we spend time together. And probably the third time we met together, I said, I want to ask you a question. And, and um, it's going to be a very difficult question for you. I'm going to ask you the question if you have been using cocaine this past week. And, and, and what I want to do is, 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 if you have, I want to use this as an occasion for you to speak honestly about this for perhaps the first time in your life. Okay. Uh, that's, your, your instinct is going to be to cover up. I would like to show you a different way. So I'm going to ask you the question. Have you used cocaine this week? And he confessed that he had. Well, what do you do? If you believe there's such a thing as progressive sanctification, on one hand, the guy's using cocaine. <laughs> on the other hand, he spoke honestly to you. Uh, and and, and, and there, there are two different languages, Satan's language and God's language. Satan is a liar. And if you want to see your affinity for Satan or a person's affinity for Satan, watch, watch, watch when they try to cover up. But here's a person, instead of covering up, he spoke the truth. In that sense, he's speaking the very language of God. He's speaking honestly of his struggles. In which case, if, if, if it would, progressive sanctification allows you to see the good in this guy's life and allows you to celebrate, it's, it's time for a party. Here's a guy who has just been using cocaine, but it's time for a party because it's the first time in his life he has confessed these things that could get him in trouble on his own. So, so my question was, how do you change? How do other people change? And, and we grow in fits and starts, in this thing called progressive sanctification. We don't move into perfection immediately. Nobody has. But, but we grow in these small steps. Progressive sanctification allows you to see that those incremental steps of good in another person's life. And and, and for you, that is, what a gift that is. <laughs> to, be, to, to have your eyes peeled for the work of the Spirit. And by the way, the simple fact that the person is talking with you as a Christian is, is something good. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're speaking to somebody who knows Jesus and is going to give something of Jesus to them. And, and that itself is something you can identify as good in their life. Hard, but, but good. Progressive sanctification allows you to see the, 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 the bad things in a person's life, but also to identify here are the places where the Spirit is on the move. It's, it blesses your own soul, and it also blesses the other person. To see the good, even in the midst of, of sin, there are, there's you know, that movement toward uh, the right direction. So, a few different questions, ultimately theological questions. Who are you? You are, you, you prize, you boast in your inadequacy. Who are you? How do you change? You, no one has changed. I see the problem, and now I mastered the problem. I, no one has changed in that. In my relationship with my wife, one of the one of the, um, uh, the, and maybe I'll t talk about this in another, uh, another seminar throughout the week. One of the things that I have seen in my own life is, is, is a tendency to want to be right. And a want to be right can, can sometimes sound like I have her best interests at heart. Okay, this is right, and I am going to give her the thing that is right. And, 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 and how many times has that been an issue in our marriage? 
where, where, where finally the spirit comes along and, and says there's a difference between being right and loving another person. And, I, and I am, I'm undone by the spirit, and then six months later it happens again. Six months later it happens again. But what we're hoping for is, is, is a repentance where it happens in eight months rather than six months. It happens in ten months rather than, rather than six months. And, and if it does happen, there's a humility to be able to, to deal with that particular sin more and more quickly. You see what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm saying that if, if I would talk to you about different, different times there's been tensions in my relationship with my wife, it would be a very similar story. Each one would sound the same. And you'd be thinking, well, has Ed ever changed in his life? And, and I, I would argue that I probably have. But, but you have to see that I, I deal with, I, I see those sins a little bit more quickly. I, I'll ask forgiveness a little bit more quickly. It happens a bit less frequently. We don't change all at once. We change progressively. And in your pastoral care, one, one of the things that I think all of us want to grow in is how can we see the good in another person? And, and point it out, recognize, whether they know it or not, it is ultimately the good that is from God himself. What I'm doing is I'm just taking a few different theological categories and allowing them to inform how we see ourselves and, and how we care for other people. Let me, let me give you a few more. And this will seem like, like somewhat dry and sterile theology, uh, but but no, there's no such thing as dry and sterile theology. Who are you? Go with the same question, but, but let me answer it a different way. Here's, the question now I'd like to ask is, I'd like to take an x-ray of you. And, and in that x-ray, what do I see? What do I see? There are three possibilities. One is, I, you, are, you, are, you consist of one substance. That's the only thing I'm going to see in the x-ray. And it's, it's material substance. A, another would be, we consist of two substances. And we consist of body. And... I'll just put heart in there as, as the soul. So my question here is, is we all have a kind of x-ray of humanity. What is your x-ray of humanity? The third one, uh, by the way, uh, in, in, in most conversations, secular conversations, this is the only answer. Uh, in, 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 in Christian conversations, I, th I think this can engage the conversation, but most Christians, I think, have, have a, who, who are you? You are body, you are soul, and you are spirit. Now, I, I know that, that probably within here, we all, they're representatives of each of these different perspectives. My point is that each of these perspectives will affect your actual pastoral care. It will affect the things that you say. It will affect the ways you respond. Um, and, and, and I want to be careful here because I know that this is the, among Christian counselors, this is the most prominent view of how many substances do you consist of? It sounds like a strange question. But it's a, it's a question within philosophy. It's a question that scripture deals with as well. The most prominent answer is I consist of body, of soul, and of spirit. Now, I, th what is, I, I think over, over time, there have been some problems with this particular theology. And, and you can find that theology in, in a diagram like this, 
You can also find the theology in in an attempt to be comprehensive. So you can find it in an answer like this. Who are you? You are an emotional, cognitive, social, spiritual being. That's, that's oftentimes the way you'll see it in books. Now, the, what I have seen with, with that particular anthropology or view of the person is that, that you have a spiritual compartment in you. That, so, so this is, this is spiritual is one of many compartments. As a, as, a, as a Christian counselor, you want to addre address all these different compartments, including the spiritual. I would suggest that what Scripture does, it, it makes Jesus relevant to one particular category. Jesus is not quite as relevant to the emotional or the cognitive or the social at times. He's relevant to the, the spiritual. So when you talk about spiritual problems, that's when you begin to talk about Jesus. So sometimes I find that this particular, this, when, there are three, when there are three substances, it tends, to, it tends to push scripture and Jesus over to the side because, because Jesus and scripture don't seem to be speaking about psychological problems that much. So I would suggest to you that, that, that over the past 30 years, Having, having seen some of the deficiencies with this, what I, what I will suggest to you today is this is a way of, of seeing you and humanity. That who are you? You are body and soul. And, and the body is, is, is one of a number of different influences. And, 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 and other people are a huge influence on our lives. Your education is an influence. Your, 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 your particular country and your, 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 your tribe, your, your nation is going to be an influence. Demons and spiritual beings are going to be an influence. So the body's not the only influence on you. It's one of many. And essentially here we're saying you consist of two parts. You consist of body and soul. And I would suggest to you that that has important pastoral implications that I think can be very helpful. So let me, let me I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna first take, it, take these two. What difference does it make that you're body and soul? And then we'll move into the question, what is this thing called the soul? Because that's our particular interest. We really need to get that one right. Because as pastoral counselors, that is, that's what we're aiming for. But before we get there, just a few thoughts about the body and, and soul. Uh, let me read to you a couple, uh, just a couple statements from the church over the years. Uh, my soul will be taken immediately after this life to Christ. And after that, my very flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my soul. What is it? It's one of the... It's one of the classic expressions of, of, of who are we in the history of the church. Here's another. The bodies of humanity after death, they return to the dust, but their souls, which neither sleep nor die, have an immortal substance, it immediately return to God who, who gave it. Are we one substance, two, or three? Uh, the history of the church would suggest that we are two. Now, the first question is, is what does it mean that we are bodies? What, what is it that the body can do? The, the body is, 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 is typically spoken about in scripture as being strong or being weak, being strong or weak. It's, it's my eyesight is weak. I can see, I can see blobs of color right now but I can't see anything else. So my eyesight is weak. Some of you have eyesight that's, that's very strong. 
Our, 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 our sense of hearing can be strong or weak. Our physical bodies, our musculature, our muscles can be strong or, or they can be weak. So the scripture, when you find the scripture talking about strong and weak, it is especially talking about the impact of the human body. The soul, on the other hand, I'll just do this briefly now, the soul is since the moral director of, of the human being. The body is never called sinful. It doesn't have that kind of capacity. It can, it can be a stumbling block that leads us into sin, but the body simply cannot make you sin. Sin is a matter of the heart or the soul or the spirit. Here's one way the scripture tends to, tend to talk about the two. It's 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and following. Paul says something like this. Though outwardly, the stuff that you can see, we're wasting away. If you're older than age 25, your body's wasting away. You know, it's like this. Uh, and it starts earlier than we think. Uh, uh, though outwardly, our body is wasting away, inwardly, our spirits, our souls, can be renewed day by day. So even in the midst of outer decline, our souls can be renewed. That's, that's the basic principle that, that you find in Scripture. Here's how it affects your pastoral care. My wife and I had two daughters. We still have two daughters. They're older now. The, the first one loved to sleep. She just loved to sleep. I can, remember, I can remember when she was probably, what, six months old? Walking, even less than that, walking, taking her into her crib to go to sleep for the night, and she'd almost jump out of my arms. She'd see the crib, and she'd, oh, 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 she'd get all excited, and she'd, she'd try to dive into her crib. She'd just sort of get her blanket and nestle all in, and off she was. She loved to sleep, and she's, how old is she now? 30, she's 35? You have a daughter who's 35? You're old. Uh, uh, she's 35 years old, and she still loves to sleep. Wow. My point is this. At one time, she was probably th four or so, uh, and, and we had just driven quite a distance. And we got to our house. It was fairly late. She was asleep in her seat. We went and got her, and she, she was so upset that we would wake her up from her sleep. All we were going to do was take her from her seat in the car to, to, her, to, her, to her bed. And she started kicking and screaming and yelling. And, and we're thinking, what our daughter is doing is very wrong. It's just very wrong. She, she is in rebellion against us. We said, Lindsay, what we're doing, listen to us. Listen, stop what you're doing. We're taking you to bed. And she wouldn't stop. And so we decided we would use it as an occasion to instruct her to listen, to, to submit to her parents as unto the Lord. And, and so for the next half hour or so, we tried to teach her and discipline her. And, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And finally, we gave up. And we put her back to bed. Well. What am I saying? I'm saying that, that when you do pastoral care, you're doing it to embodied souls. And, and sometimes you're going to focus on what the body is up to. And the best thing that we could have done for our daughter when she was being utterly rebellious would have been to simply say nothing and just put her in bed, kicking and screaming, just put her in bed because she needed to sleep. And then the next day, after she's had a good night's sleep, we can say, you know, Linz, you are, you are quite the rascal when you're, when you're tired. <laughs> and, and we're going to pray for you that you learn more and more self-control when you're tired. You know what we're talking about. Do you remember kicking and screaming and yelling? And you remember that. Well, what you're, we're going to pray for you is that, that you can follow Jesus even when you're tired. So what am I doing? It's, it's pastoral care but pastoral care that is familiar with how the body can create weaknesses that are difficult. The body did not make her sin, but the body was making was quite a nuisance for her at, at that particular time. Let me give you two other illustrations here. 
a, a, a man who was in a car accident and had a head injury in the car accident. Uh, he, he had a job, he was living in his own apartment, he was probably 23 years old. Uh, because of the accident, he moved back in with his father. His, his mother had, uh, had, had, was deceased. His father, it, it was just driving his father absolutely mad to live with this particular fellow. And it's because it was always the father's fault. He was blaming the father. Every time, every, every time the son did something wrong, he would blame the father. It's hard to have a relationship with somebody who's always, who's always blaming other people for his own sins. We got together and, we, and it became obvious that he's always blaming other people. And so I, I, so I tried to speak to him about it. Um, and you know, you're always pointing the finger at others. And, and you have to deal, you have to deal with your own heart. And he said, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And then he would do the same thing. I had no idea what to do. Finally, out of my frustration, I simply read Matthew 7 to him. Matthew 7, 3 to 5. Matthew 7, 3 to 5, it's the log and the speck. It's, it's why do you look for the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own eye. First, see clearly, remove the log from your own eye, then you can see your brother. I just read the passage to him. I read it out of frustration. It was very unskillful pastoral care. I just was mad at the guy. I didn't even want to talk to him. And, and his, first, his first response was, was, was fascinating. He said, I don't have a log in my eye. I have a forest in my eye. I have an entire forest. And here's what happened. In his brain injury, he lost the ability to think abstractly. There are two ways, children, they think very concretely. They see it, uh, and they have to be able to see it or feel it or touch it to make sense out of it. Uh, but, but as you move on in your education, you can, you can work with categories. For example, um, uh, the word blaming. The word blaming, it, it, it's not a very vivid picture. So that's what you're looking for. Can you put this in a picture? That's going to make it available to somebody whose mind is not working very well. And in the word blame, it's, it's very complicated. It's, okay, you've done something, but you're saying other people are responsible for what you've done. It's hard to see it. And it just so happens what the scripture does is it puts things very concretely. It puts our life in a story form and so Matthew 7 is a very concrete way of talking about blaming. And the problem was not his, it turns out. The problem was my own. The problem was that I didn't understand some of the strengths and weaknesses of his, not just his body, but his brain at that particular time. And, and, and I just assumed that he could understand words that were a bit more abstract. But... But when we understand the body, what it does with us is it makes our language a little bit more vivid for another person. It, it, it makes us speak in metaphors a little bit more clearly so other persons can see the problem. A, a couple always fighting, um, trying to help them see it. Finally, I think at one point I said, I'm, I can't stand seeing you at war all the time. And they said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And, and they said, I, I, I feel like I'm going to get shot every time we're, we're together because that's all you do. And they said, well, what, us? We're at war? It, it, was, it, was, like a, it was like a new, uh, it, it opened their eyes. The word war, you can see it. It's vivid, and it's available to minds that sometimes cannot see things in the abstract. I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm just, who are you? Who are other people? They are embodied souls. And, 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 and in your care, as your care grows for others, 
is going to grow in understanding the various influences on a person's soul. Let me just give you one more uh, illustration here. I think this, this, is, um, th this, this shows the beauty of, of Scripture's insight. A man who is called bipolar. I suspect you understand what bipolar is. It's, it's, it's these, 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 um, these various movements into, into a lifestyle that is highly energetic, a mind that is racing, and a mind that is out of control. When you're in these times, you feel like nothing bad can happen. Nothing bad. But it's the opposite of depression. In depression, you feel like nothing good will ever happen. Nothing good has ha happened in the past. Nothing good will ever happen in the future. Mania, you, or bipolar, the, the upside of bipolar, you feel like nothing bad can ever happen. So as a result, people who move into these bipolar episodes, they tend to do very foolish things. They, they tend to gamble their money away because nothing bad can happen. Because they're gonna, they know the odds on gambling, but it's not going to happen to them. Uh, or they, 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 they become reckless and they simply do not, they're not aware of the consequences of their behavior. So sometimes it's financial foolishness, other times it's sexual foolishness because they're not thinking of the consequences, uh, the consequences against God or the consequences against other people. Here's a man who, in the midst of his bipolar episode, he, he, was, he, was, sec he, was, he, was, he was he was sexually involved outside of his marriage. And his, they'd been separated for many years at this point. To make a long story a little bit shorter, they, be, they began their relationship again. They began to be friends, the husband and wife, after a number of years. And the question was, could they reconcile? And, and the question was, can you promise that you'll be faithful to me? That's what the wife asked the husband. He said, no, I can't promise that I'll be faithful because sometimes I move into these bipolar episodes. Makes sense. He's, he's faithful when he's not bipolar, but he's not faithful when he is bipolar. So it seems like the bipolar is what makes him unfaithful. But our, our, our belief is this, that the body can't make you sin. Sin is a matter of the heart. If the body made you sin, this, life would be extraordinary. You get the sniffles, you, know, you get a cold, and all of a sudden you, you're authorized to sin. You, you, you know, no matter what the problem is, it, it leaves you vulnerable to sin. What a, what a horrible thought that would be. So you speak to this man, and, and you suggest to him that bipolar, it can't make you sin. It can make, make life much more difficult for you and for other people, but it can't make you sin. That if you have been, if you have been adulterous, you have been adulterous not the bipolar. And this person's willing to consider that seriously. That's not to say that, that bipolar is sin. But, but then what do you do? In your pastoral care, you don't have to be an expert in bipolar. And by the way, the experts are already talking to this person, so you don't need other experts. You're, you're zeroing in on the person's heart. And, and you know that the heart is all about giving ourselves over to our desires. And, and so you, you ask him, just why don't you tell this story about, about sexuality in your life? Why don't you simply tell your sexual story? And, and his sexual story was, 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 was a relatively common one. He, as he grew up, he became sexually active. Uh, as, as he, he, he was, um, uh, he, as he, as he realized, as, as he felt guilty about those time, times, he, he began to be less sexually active. That was about the time he met his wife. He, he allowed himself to be sexually active in his mind. So he, he would feed his imaginations, uh, and occasionally he would dabble in pornography, but he was faithful, he was otherwise faithful to his wife. Do you, do you see what we're saying? We're saying that his sexual sin, it, pre, it, it came before he was adulterous. 
Uh, and it came before he was adulterous because, because he was saying, okay, I will, just, I will just be sexual in my own mind, and that won't hurt anybody. Well, if you are going to give yourself to sexual imaginations, and then you are going to move into mania, you will act on your imaginations. So he repented of the imaginations of his heart. Not just his overt behavior, but his imaginations. The next time he went into, and he, and he grew dramatically, the next time he went into a bipolar episode, he, it was a horrible bipolar episode. For, for a week, it seems like he didn't sleep at all. And he was just, his mind was racing, he was delusional, just speaking, just, just nonstop speaking. And there were a group of people who tried to just, just be with him during that time. And one of the things they said was that he was, he was unusual, he was, he was insane, but, but he wasn't flirtatious. He, he didn't violate any sexual boundaries in the midst of his mania. You see, see how that makes sense? It, it, it's, it, it, it's for you and your pastoral care, it means that you can move toward even these much more difficult situations without having to be an expert in these situations where, where there are things that you don't understand, but, but you do understand the things that are most important. <laughs> turning to Christ and in following Christ in obedience and in the commitment to putting boundaries around our sinful desires rather than acting on them. So those are, you know, so all we're doing is we're going to one little piece of your theology and just illustrating how that can continue to enhance your own pastoral care. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm, for, before we take a break, now, now here's, the, here's this question. What is this? What is this? We are embodied souls. The scripture, I would suggest the scripture speaks about the very center of your being and in every human being's center as the soul, the heart, the spirit, the mind, these are all overlapping words for this, for this very center of humanity. Your pastoral care, you want to have a very clear sense of who it is that you're talking to. So what I'd like to do is I would like to just, just, just identify some of, of the, the, the features of the human heart. And, and your goal is, so what? What difference does this make in my pastoral care? What difference does it make for the way I see myself? What difference does it make for the way that I care for, for other people? So that's going to be your job. So again, it's a rhetorical question, but my question is practically, meaningfully, how do you understand this? This is what you're aiming for. Pastoral care is, is is aiming for the soul of the human being. How do you do such a thing? I would suggest to you that, that the human heart, like, like we mentioned before, it has a certain depth to it. It's, it's that well that you don't, what you see on the surface, there's more to it than that. Which, oh, which by the way, which, which in your pastoral care, it's, what are, you, what, are you, what are you thinking? There's more to this person than I realize. There's more to this person than I know. And so in your pastoral care, along with listening, a simple question, tell me more, tell me more. Help me to understand just a little bit more. You, you, you see, the, the, the very, the, our very entrance into the human heart, we're suggesting it has a certain depth. And some of that depth, depth can, tends to be hidden to the person themselves and also to us. How do we invite more from the human heart? Tell me more. Help me to understand more. Can you see how this particular theology, it, 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 it gives us a rationale for listening just a little bit longer to the other person? 
the, origin, the, the initial entrance to the heart, I would suggest, is in through the person's desires. In through the person's desires. And, and by the way, in this, you know, what do you desire? What do you want? What's most important to you? They're all the same questions. Can, can, can you see how, if, how are the sports teams in your area? What's the weather like? Can you hear the difference between those questions? Tell me about your family. And to, to the question such as, what's most important to you? What's most, can you see how I'm going farther in? I'm, I'm moving, I'm moving toward the heart. You are constructed around desires, loves and likes. The first entrance is you have certain natural desires. And I'm not going through all the scripture on this. There is scripture that we could identify, but, um, but I, I'll, I'll skip over some of those details. You have natural desires. You have natural desires to live rather than to die. You have a natural desire for there to be peace in your relationships rather than war in your relationships. You have natural desire for health over illness. You have a natural desire for food rather than, rather than being destitute. You have a natural desire for shelter. You have a natural desire for work. These are some of the things that are important to you. At this particular level, what I'm listening for are your pleasures and your pains. The, your pleasures are desires that have been satisfied in some small way. How's your relationship with your spouse going? Oh, it's, just, it's been a great, it's, it's, it's been a very rich time for us. Uh, uh, and what, that's a pleasure. What do you do when you hear a person's pleasures? You do something, you're moved by them. You're like, that's, that's great, that's wonderful. Oh, and by the way, if notice how this goes. If, um, if you ask, how's your relationship with your wife? I said, that's, uh, thanks for asking. It's, I, think, I really think we're growing. We're growing. We, we love each other. We enjoy each other. We're growing in Christ together. Sins are, 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 are less intrusive than they were. Uh, this, is, this has been a very good time. And if you would say, well, thanks for telling me. I'm so, I'm so glad to hear that. Do you, do you understand what's going to happen? That, that the next time there are important things in my heart, I'm going to talk to you about those things. Because because you actually showed interest in the things that were important to me. When I spoke about my relation, you asked about my relationship with my spouse, and when I spoke about it, you, you actually showed interest and were moved by those things. What's important? What do you like? What do you love? How do you feel? By the way, you see how, 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 how this encompasses our emotions. Typically, we put emotions outside of the realm of the spiritual. But this is placing our, which is unfortunate because the, our emotions are what? They're the things that are, we're, we're identifying the things that are most important in our lives. Uh, and, to, and to place that outside the human heart bankrupts the human heart. How do you feel today? How do you feel? You, that's, that question is, is a biblical question. It's a biblical question that what's on your heart? How do you feel? You feel great? You feel miserable? You feel afraid? You feel... These are the things. The, this is the entrance into the human heart. It's, how are you? How are you feeling? What are the things 
that are important to you. With the good things, we enter into the person's joy. With the hard things, we share their grief. So what we're doing is, is we're, we're simply taking little pieces of theology and, and, and since our pastoral care, and since our skills in pastoral care are ultimately going to rise out of our understanding of what scripture says, we're just, we're just shoring up what is, what is arguably one of the most in question, important questions in pastoral care, what is the heart of the people that you're speaking with? How do you speak to the human heart? So we're, we're just trying to take a quick review of that and especially interested in, so what? How, how will this make a difference in the way we speak to, to our friends, to our family, to the people in our congregation? Let's take a break. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for, thank you for opportunities to grow, and, and I pray that, that we would grow. Would you be gracious? Would you shape our minds and our hearts, our conversations, and, and equip us to be able to love others just a bit more wisely? In the name of Jesus, amen. If I, if I would summarize the, what we just spoke about before we took a break, it would be the skill of inviting, of inviting. I, we want to be able to invite and welcome people to speak openly from their heart. That's, that's what we're after. And, and the, 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 since there's always a why in ministry, there's a reason for it. We're not simply trying to be nice. There, there, is, there are biblical theological reasons centered in God himself. We invite because that's what God does in his house. That's the way the kingdom of heaven operates. That some of you have heard me say these things before, but they're so important. When you read the Psalms, there are all kinds of levels for reading the Psalms. Uh, It's it's the story of Israel. It's the story of King David. It's, it's, It's the story of Jesus, who is the who is the psalmist who stands behind all the psalms. It is also the way we're supposed to talk in God's house. This is the way we speak to the Lord. And and, and and with that in mind, isn't it wonderful that there's so many psalms? These are the ways you can speak to the Lord. In, In some ways, the psalms all are, their entry to the psalm is always an invitation. Speak from your heart. That's what the Lord is inviting you to do. Speak from your heart. And and there are times where the things on our heart, it's as if there are no words for them. There are some things that are too good or too bad to be even able to put into words. And then the Psalms will say, is it like this? Is it like this? Is it like being surrounded by enemies? Is it, is it, is it, is it struggling with jealousies as you see people who, who, who don't follow the Lord when they seem to thrive? Is it, is it when you feel like you need to hear the voice of God and he seems especially silent? Why have you forsaken me? Why do you seem so far away? You see, the Psalms are these invitations, and, and the Lord is, is, is not only inviting, but he's, he's helping us. Let me help you with some of the words. Is it like this? And then, once we go through the entire corpus of the Psalms, it's as if the Lord says, now you write the Psalms. Now you write Psalm 156 and 157 and 158. So, so that's the skill that we were, we were moving toward right before the break. How well do you invite? And, 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 and perhaps the, the more significant question is, do you know that you have been invited to speak from your heart to the Lord? If you do not know that, if you have not practiced speaking your own heart to the Lord like a psalmist, then chances are 
you're not going to be very inviting to other people. So we invite because that's the way things are done in the kingdom of heaven. That's, if we imagine, if we imagine the divine banquet, it's, it's this peculiar banquet where the Lord himself is the center of everything. He is the one who's showing us the hospitality. He is the, he is the one, who, the brilliant one, whose love it, it just attracts our attention. And, and then he says, now you speak. Now you speak. What's on your heart? It's the oddest thing. It's, it's just not what we would accust, be accustomed to. A, a, a king saying such things. The king, our king is known by us, and and we are known by him. But even though he knows us better than we know ourselves, somehow he values us putting that into speech, to put words on it. That is, why is that part of the kingdom of heaven? Well, we can speculate for all kinds of reasons why, but this is the way we were created to be. It is simply right and good for us to be able to speak from our hearts, our pleasures and our pains, to our God who is affected by them. When when it says he remembers or he listens, it's an action verb. He is doing something about what we have said. We, We might not see all the details. The veil of heaven is pulled back every once in a while but we know for certain that he is the God who is moved by what we say. And perhaps we can add to that and say that he says to us, speak of your griefs, your fears, your bondage, your struggles, your... Speak of anything. The requirement is simply that we speak to him, knowing something of who he is. And he never minimizes those things. He never says, well, your problems are so much less than this other person's. He never, ever minimizes them. Where we can have a tendency to compare and contrast our own struggles. And, but God never does that. You can see why. Because if we think that somebody else's struggles are greater than our own, why should we bother speaking those things to God or to anybody else? You see the sort of satanic sort of fingerprints behind that spiritual way of thinking. Come on, grow up. Look at these people who are dying. Look at people, look at children who are in cancer wards. Well, the Lord never, ever says that. His delight is to speak with us and for us to respond to him. And for us to speak and he responds to us. So that's the way into the heart. We invite to speak openly of desires, of desires that have been satisfied, of of, of desires that have been delayed and and have been denied. We are moved by what a person says. Now, as we move a little bit deeper, and, and, and deeper means it's going to be harder to get to. I... I had a man who came into my office one time, and he said, how did he say it? He said, I am a homosexual alcoholic. That's the way he came into my office. But, but, I had, he had, he had he, I, I met him first after he had some seizures, some epileptic seizures, and he wasn't able to drive, and life was just so difficult as a result. Now, it turns out the seizures were because he was going through alcoholic withdrawals, and nobody found out. But I knew this man for a year, and we walked together for a year where, where, where I, I invited, and I think when he spoke, I, 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 I was careful with the things that he said. So after a year, he... He, he, he comes marching into my office, and he says, I'm a homosexual alcoholic. And he would have never done that if we hadn't had the months where I was caring gently and graciously and then hopefully wisely for the other things that were in his life. You see what I'm saying? That, that, that 
Our life is constituted according to desires. What do you want? What, what seems like it would be satisfying? But then there is a deeper level, and it's those desires that have a tendency to bend toward righteousness or unrighteousness. I would suggest those are deeper because we don't go around saying I'm a homosexual alcoholic. Because Judith and I were just, just speaking a little bit during the break, and, and she's, she, was, she was identifying how there's so much sexual ruin in the church by what people, especially by what people are doing, not to mention what people have had done against them. And those are things that you don't say in the first five minutes when you know someone. Those are things that come out after you've invited someone to speak. I have a friend who uses the illustration of, of this fine china in somebody's life, where they have given you a little tiny bit, just a little cup, a little piece of fine china, but you've cared for it carefully. It's a kind of test. And, and then they'll bring out just a little bit more china and a little bit more china. And, and perhaps at some point, they will talk about some of their struggles with sin. That's a little bit deeper into the human heart. The, the movement toward Christ uh, and the movement away from him. The sin comes out of our hearts. What, what we hope is, is to create a community where people can speak about their pleasures and their pains, their struggles in turning to Christ, and their struggles when they turn away from Christ. That's, we, we ourselves want to grow in our pastoral skills to contribute to a community that, that hears, that, that receives such things. So, if someone is speaking to you about their struggle with sin, well done, well done. And, and then the question becomes, how can you continue to invite them to speak? Now you see the stakes are high here because, because we know that Satan's tendency is we cover up, we hide. We, 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 we try to put our sins in the darkness as if God nor other human being is able to see them. So we continue to want to invite. Have, have you ever asked for prayer in your own struggle with sin? Have you ever asked for prayer for such things? I, some, I've talked to you some, some of you about this before. I, I would prefer to invite another person than to be invited. I, I, I am willing to talk about the pleasures and pains more than my struggle with sin. I can remember a, a friend of mine one time, he said, how is your heart? You see, you see what he was saying? He was saying, I want to hear about your pleasures and pains, but I'm especially interested in the moral direction of your desires. Are they moving you to Jesus or away from Jesus? It was, it, it was, it was a shocking question because I don't think anybody has ever asked me that question before except for my wife. She'll ask me that question sometimes. But other than, other than that, no one is ever asked. And, and sometimes it's because we're polite. Sometimes we recognize intuitively that to ask somebody about where is your struggle with sin, usually we, we want to have a relationship with them where we've cared well for their pleasures and pains first. The human heart has depth to it. And, and, in not, and, and, and certainly in some of your pastoral situations where people come and confess to you, that, that, is, that is a gift that the other person has gift, given you. But I'm especially interested in your relationships where they're just ordinary, everyday relationships. And there, has the invitation been available even, even in those relationships? 
Now the question is how, when somebody confesses sin to you, how can you, how can you, how can you handle such matters in a way that takes sin very seriously, yet also invites the person to continue to speak together about these things? So, so I'll, I'll delay that question for, for a moment, but that's an important question for us because of our understanding of the human heart. Because we understand that below, it's getting our pleasures and pains, and see, we're moving closer to the very, very center of the heart. The moral direction of our desires is still a matter of desire, but are they desires that have been unleashed and, and set loose to go anywhere they want? Or are they desires that have been bounded, as Proverbs says, bounded by knowledge? What it means to be human especially as we go through the Old Testament, is a human being, we all have desires. A wise human being puts limits on his or her desires. We, we, we all have affections, but a wise person is the one who, who puts boundaries around his or her affection. So when they see the, when they see the, uh, the, the tree, and they see that it's a bit more attractive than they thought, that that their wisdom to be truly human is to be able to say no. Okay, I, I, I desire that, but, but I, will, I will live under the wisdom of God and, and I will learn to say no to that particular desire. That's not merely self-control. That is, in some ways, the entire enterprise of being a human being. A, an animal doesn't say no to his or her desires, but a human being from, from the very beginning of creation, that's the question. Can we discern the difference between right and wrong? And, and how in our hearts can we practice saying no to the wrong and saying yes to the right? Scripture talks about our hearts as being idolatrous and, and given over to, to lusts and simply our own desires. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. How can we grow? How can, how, can, how can we invite in such a way that people speak about these things? And, and once they speak about them, how can we be, grow in our skillfulness in helping them? So I'll, I'll put that on pause just for a moment and go to the, the one farther place in. Now see, this is, this is the construct of every single human heart. We are all set up this way. Farther in is, it's our desires, it's, but it's our desires as they are directed toward a person. Not to righteousness or unrighteousness. Our desires as they are directed toward righteousness or unrighteousness reveal our desires toward a person. Do we turn toward our God or do we turn away from him? Romans 1 is interesting in this regard where it talks about how all humanity knows the God. They know the God. And, and um, I'm all for apologetics. And I, I understand there's a really a very fine, apolo a few apologetics tracks uh, this, this week. But as a counselor, as a, as, as a pastor, I don't have to do apologetics. Because, because a person who's an atheist and, and and, 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 and here's you wanting to pray and things like that. Well, they'll, they'll find it silly until there's suffering in their lives. I'm thinking about a particular friend of mine who, who just died recently. And he, he, was a, he was an atheist, a committed atheist. I only believe what I can see. And then his family began to fall apart. It just began to fall apart. And a man who would, would roll his eyes at me. If I, if I asked to pray for him. Now I said, could I pray for you? And he said, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's the knowledge of God is suppressed. It, it, our sin suppresses it. And, and sometimes our money and our, and, and our pleasures in life suppress it. But, but the hardships of life tend to reveal that life is lived before God. This is the deepest question of of every single human being. It's not a sector of life. 
it is, there is nothing more profound than our fundamental allegiances. That doesn't mean everybody sees it clearly, but it's true all the same. It's the reason why, why, some, why, why when we go to a good worship service, we feel different. We feel different because we have done something very human. We have done something that has addressed the very depths of our souls. We have, we have spoken together of our allegiances to the true God. When, when a non-Christian hears worship, it, it's, there, 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 there might be something that invites them to that. Because that, that, that fundamental humanity of, of seeing the greatness of God and being drawn to him is being aroused in some way. So, what does this mean? It, it means, means things like this. Sometimes depression, it, you, you feel so isolated and as if there's nothing good, you feel like God is irrelevant. You just feel like he's, he might be there, but he's unengaged in, in your life. Well, I know something, and you know something about a depressed person. At the very heart of their, their souls is who is your God? And will you turn toward him? Will you hear him? Will his beauty attract you, or will you, will you turn to your own devices? And so, notice how simple this is. If you're talking to somebody who's struggling with depression, and, and you've tried everything to try to persuade and try to help this person, and you feel like you have no idea what else to do, which is the way I often feel with people who struggle with depression, you might do something like this. The next time you meet with them, you might have your devotions with them. You might, I was thinking about you the other day, and, and I, was, I was reading scripture the other day, and I was reading scripture and I was thinking about you. I mean, let me just, let me just read this particular passage. And, and who knows, it doesn't matter what the passage is, but a passage of scripture, where all scripture points us ultimately to Jesus Christ, you simply have a devotional moment with a depressed person. How much more simple could that be? But do you realize in that moment, you are speaking to the very depths of that person's soul in a way that no other non-Christian view of help could possibly do. Now you see, one of the things I'm, I'm doing right now is, is, is the, 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 our, our, our task is how can we grow in our pastoral skillfulness? But I'm, I'm also, one of the things that can inhibit your skillfulness is, you, is not only do you feel inadequate, but you th feel like the gospel is small as it addresses human problems. That there, are, that, that, that there are people beyond the scope of the gospel. Depression, psychiatric problems being an example of those. Well, to realize that we are all human beings. And as human beings, the knowledge of God is at the very depths of the human heart. And, and, you, and, you, and you hear these great prayers in Ephesians, in Ephesians 1, that you would know your God and his great power. See, the prayer is, prayer identifies the things that we need. And, and there Paul is going to the very heart of our humanity. He does the same thing in Ephesians chapter 3. The very heart of your humanity is spoken to with, what's your struggle today? Let's, let's go back to the most important thing, that you have a God who in the person of Christ has loved you in, in ways that, that are beyond the, the scope of our understanding. And let's pray. Before we talk about this the struggle you have in your relationship, Let's pray that we would know this particular Jesus. And you pray. And then you begin to speak about the God. You speak together about the God who, when we were enemies, that's when his love was, was lavished on us. You consider, you consider something of the death and resurrection of Christ that was his plan from the beginning. And then you talk about the daily struggles 
that a person has. What is it? It's, it, it's, there couldn't be anything more ordinary, but, but our understanding of who we are indicates that you have just done something more profound and more spiritual than you could possibly imagine. That doesn't mean the person's going to respond immediately. Your sanctification is a sloppy process. Sometimes we have ears to hear and, and, and sometimes we don't. So, the question is, who is the person you're speaking to? Who are we? And there are different answers to that question. This is, this is one particular answer where, where, you, where you have a particular interest in the person's heart. And the heart is constituted around desires. Desires for natural desires, good desires for peace and life and love and, and, and to be loved. Desires as they begin to take a moral direction. For example, the desire to be loved. Every single human being has a desire to be loved. If, if they don't have a desire to be loved, there's something very frightening about them and, 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 and inhuman about it. But here's where we put desires in boundaries where my desire to love can never exceed my commitment to love. That's what we see in the person of Jesus Christ. Did, was being loved natural to him as a human being? Indeed, it was natural. But when he did not receive love, he didn't become less than human. The question became at that point, what does it mean to love as is the Father has loved me, and, and I love others. So that's where we, who are we? We're people who either have our desires within bounds, or they're unleashed. That's what lust is. Who are we? Everything hinges on your spiritual allegiances. Do you love your God? Do you follow him? Do you obey him? Or do you follow your own desires? Or do you follow your idols? Or do you follow the world, the flesh, and the devil? And this scripture has all kinds of ways of speaking about this. Let me I'm going to ask you the, the question in, in just a moment. How are you growing in, in helping those who struggle with different kinds of sufferings? How are you growing in, in helping those who struggle with different kinds of sins? I want to ask you that and, and um, see if we can grow in those things together because those are the, that's, they're the staples of, of our care for one another. Let me just take you to one, one particular passage here. That we're, we're, This is James. This is the book of James. It's, it's, it's talking about anger, but it's... It gives you a pretty good sense of the human heart. Why do you have quarrels and why do you have fights? It's because you, you desire, and, and your desires essentially are not in boundaries. You desire, uh, and, and, and so you murder, you covet, you cannot have, so you fight and you quarrel. You have because you don't ask. You don't ask, and you ask and you do not receive because all you want is for your own desires to, to mushroom. What's it saying? It's saying here's one aspect of the human heart. It's going, James is penetrating deeper, and he's saying, I know something about you, that you are a person who's, who, who is a person of desire. Our desires can... The, they can turn, like, turn into an animal kind of desire. And you want, and all you care about is what you want. You covet, and you will kill if people are in your way. That's one way of describing the nature of anger. You can see how James is, 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 is offering this wisdom that penetrates the heart. And he goes on and says, do you know that ultimately these desires, they have their very roots in your relationship with God himself. And he uses a few, different, a few different ways to talk about it. He says, you adulterous people, you adulterous people, you, you are forsaking the one who has loved you and has betrothed you, you adulterous people. 
It goes on later. And, and, and it, it says that you, if you make friends with this world of giving yourself over to your unrighteous desires, you, you become an enemy of God. So you see, it's, you see how, it's, how it's identifying a little bit more of the depth of the human soul. And then, in the very middle of, of the passage, and by the way, I think that's significant because so much of Hebrew thought tends to look like this, where you have this symmetry, and, and then, then you're looking for what is in the very middle. In, at least in English, the important stuff comes at the end. In Hebrew, the important stuff comes at the middle. So, so here are these desires that are out of bounds. We want to fight against them. Now we're coming to the middle. And when it comes to the middle, it says this. It says that he yearns jealously over you. You want to talk about, here, here you are. You jealously are pursuing your own desires against God. And your anger, your divisive anger is the, is the expression of that. And he is jealous for you. He's jealous for you. By the way, here's, here's why we care about, here's why we're interested in pastoral care. Because it's all good news. <laughs> here's, here's, here's some of the ugliest things in the human heart. And the, the very centerpiece is, is God is jealous for you. You become adulterous. And, and in human relationships, when somebody is adulterous, they say, good riddance leave. Obviously, a person is filled with grief, too. But the Lord, he, he pursues us, and he says, I'm jealous for you. I'm jealous because you're mine. And, and, and here you've given yourself over to something else. God's jealousy is the very center. God's jealousy communicated to us in Christ, in the reconciling work of Christ, is the very center of this. And it's out of that, now that he's spoken to the very depths of the human heart, now he's asking us, come alive, come alive. And instead of turning toward unrighteousness, now put up a fight. Put up a fight and turn toward righteousness. And that's when it says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, uh, and, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God. Cleanse your hands. Um, mourn and weep uh, as, you, as you do battle with these sins in your own soul. So it's, that's James chapter 4, great passage, from the passage you all know. But it, it's, you can see James, in a sense, working out of this kind of understanding of the heart. Desires, pleasures and pains, but he's going deeper to, to uh, pleasures and pains as they express desires going either toward righteousness or away from righteousness, and as they express our fundamental spiritual allegiances. By the way, it's, it's, isn't it a gift to us that, that Scripture gives us this x-ray of the human heart? You could never invent these things. Secular therapies, they can't invent these things. But, but we, not because we're smart, but because we've been given revelation, we... we we can see sort of the surface. Everybody knows about pleasures and pains, and a lot of therapies talk about that. But we can see the things that are even more important and, and head more deeply. And our greatest joy, and what is most helpful, is to be able to speak about who our God is and, and to be able to say something like this, that oh, when you're turned away from your God, you must not know him accurately. You must think he is somehow stingy. He, he, what do you see in the garden? Uh, it's, it, it's, God is good, but he's not that good. Because, because, he, because when we have things we want, he doesn't give us the things that we want. Uh, and, and, and so God is a bit stingy, and, and he, he just doesn't want us to have any fun. That's who he is. Well, that's the, that's the view of, that's the dis disrupted view of God in the garden. And we anticipate it's the disrupted view of, garden, of God that exists in our own hearts in some way and exists in other human hearts as well. So we, as a result, have opportunities to speak about who our God really is. 
to lavish. And, 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 and you find in the Gospels the word lavish and abundant is, is a significant way the Gospel and Epistle writers want to speak about God. His love is more than you could imagine. And when he gives life, it's abundant life. It's fuller life. That's, that is what he's up to. And it's, do you want life or do you want death? All who turn toward their own desires, it's, their, it's, this, it's this walk into what seems good for a moment, but it's ultimately this path that leads to death. We have the opportunity to invite others to hear of a lavish God whose love is, is much greater than they could possibly imagine. So, uh, we're going to move toward two questions for the rest of our time. And the questions are, how are you growing and how do you want to grow in the way you care for those who are suffering? Suffering, things have come at the person and life is hard. That is where most of your pastoral care is going to start. Something hurts. That's the difference between counseling, if you will, and discipleship. Discipleship, the person says, I want to grow. Counseling says something hurts. That's going to be your, your normal way into the human heart. So we want to continue to grow, to master more and more what Scripture says to hurting people. The second question is, and if you have the opportunity to speak to someone who is struggling with sin or not struggling with sin because they like their sin, it's not a struggle for them, they, they, they entertain it, they, they, uh, they, they move toward it. How do, you, how do you want to grow in your skill to speak to them? So those are the two questions that I want to speak about for the rest of our time. But before that, any, any questions on what we've spoken about so far? Okay, uh, then I'll, I'll ask those two questions. How do you grow, how are you growing in inviting and and considering with a person what God says to suffering people. How are you growing in that? That is, the, the questions are in order. If you, if, if, you aren't, if, if you are unskillful in that, you're not going to get to the next question. How do you deal with those who are stuck in sin? So let's take them in the order that we would normally find them in ministry. Now I'll, I'll begin with just a couple things. And and then let's, let's, let's pull, let's bring together the, the ways we haven't done well and, and the ways we have done well and the ways we want to grow. Here's what we know. It, this, is, this is growing in care for those who feel trouble and suffering in their lives. And the suffering can be a result of physical problems. The suffering can be a result of relationship loss from, from death from, from divorce, from, from people cutting them off. It could be from historical violations, sexual violations, other kinds of violations where a person's been an enemy in their life. So, so think of trouble in the broadest sense of the word. Things that have happened to us or are happening to us that have been especially hard. Here's, here's what we know, that that God invites people to speak. The, the, entire, the entire Psalter is about this. Psalm 62, 8 is a, is a passage I come back to probably every single day in ministry. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. Pour out your heart before him. Hosea, I think it's Hosea 7, 14. It, it, it's identifying the sin in Israel at that time. And, and the sin is that you cried on your beds rather than cried out to the Lord. In the midst of your national misery, you cried on your beds to no one in particular rather than cried out to the Lord. So here's what we're aiming for. We're aiming, for, we're aiming to invite the person to speak openly and with, so we can be moved, which is what we, are, which we, what we do in a community, but we, we, we are also sending the person on to be able to speak to the Lord. Pour out your heart before him. There have been times where 
What, what are small steps? What, what if a person's not able to do that for different reasons? Well, there are small steps. Perhaps we take a psalm out and, and let me read some of this psalm. Or let's read some of this psalm together and, and see if it captures your heart. For example, how does this work? Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? You ever feel that way? Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you seem to hide yourself in times of trouble? It, it, it's, does this make sense to you? Does it, does, it, does it capture some of what you're thinking? Then Psalm 10, I'm, I'm reading from Psalm 10. And Psalm 10 is especially about people who've treated us like enemies. In, the, in, in arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Don't forget the afflicted. Don't forget the afflicted. You, you don't have to take the whole psalm. Just, just take little tiny pieces of it as a way for the person to be able to enter in to, to the words of God. The way the Lord helps is he, is he says, speak. Speak to me from your heart. And then in certain ways, the whole story of Scripture becomes the things that God says to the suffering person. I'll just get started and then I'll ask you. Uh, suffering reminds us that this is not the way God intended it to be. That, that, that suffering has, has come in uh, uninvited and it will go out. But the person is right. The person is right that suffering, their, their, their suffering is a protest about how things are and saying it just simply shouldn't be this way. And it shouldn't. What else do we know? We, we know that suffering tends to leave us more vulnerable to Satan's devices. When things are going very well, the little question, is God good? It's, oh yeah, it's good. Look, look how things are going in, with my friend, with my family, with work. God certainly is good. And, and by the way, that question is a setup because you see what I just did. I didn't talk about Jesus. I, I talked about, yeah, things are going well with my marriage, things are going well in, in, in work. Well, what happens on the day when things are not going as well at work? or in marriage, or whatever, whenever, the day will come when there are hardships. And then the question, is he good? It becomes a more troubling question. Unless we, are, unless we are accustomed to saying the goodness of God is ultimately revealed most vividly in the sacrificial work of Christ. That's, that's the answer that, that disrupts Satan's devices. Suffering tends to raise that question and make it more persuasive. Is he good? He says he listens. And that question that it's so natural to have, why would a good father allow these things to happen? When, when even we're, if we're not good parents, we still want good things for, for our children and for those that we love. Let me go to the other question, which, which is the latter question, but it's in some ways it's a harder question. What, what skills are you learning in the way you care for those who are struggling with sin. Now, there are all kinds of questions here. Is the person actually struggling, or is the person simply given themselves over to it and willing to talk to you, but they love their sin and they're not going to change? So there, there are all kinds of variations on, on this particular question. But how do you speak to those who are struggling with sin? Well, just I'll talk over you for a second. Wake up! Wake up! What are you doing? You're going to death. No, stop it. That's, that's what you can do. That's, you know, you, you, Paul doesn't yell it out in the same way in Ephesians, but he, he does say that. He says, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead. Because you're, but, but there are two things here. I'm not necessarily yelling at the person. I am yelling at them, but I'm not angry with them. Uh, one of the things I find is, some, why would we get angry at a person who is walking into death? 
Well, if, if you are the one who's the recipient of their sin, I can understand that. But if you're not the one who's the recipient of their sin, there's no reason for anger. And anger will just make us stupid. But we can plead. Stop! Stop! You're going to death. You know, unrighteousness is, it feels good in the present, but it will kill you. Stop! How can, how can I stop? How can I interfere with you and keep you from death itself? That's, so that's, that's less loving and, and, and certainly within, within the scope of the way Scripture ministers. Here's another. Isaiah chapter 1. It's... We just talk about this? You're, here you are, from, from your head to your toes, you are full of wretchedness. You're full of it. And then at the end of the chapter, let's talk about this. Let's talk about these things. It's come, remember, come, let us reason together. Let us reason together. And though your hands are, are stained red, from the blood of your murderous ways, they can be cleansed. They can be cleansed. So don't think that you are forever stuck in this particular pattern and there is no hope for you. Because this is what our God does. And if we, if we paraphrase Luther, the bigger the sin, the better. <laughs> the bigger the sin, the more obvious and glorious the, the cleansing blood of himself will be for you. That's, what are we doing? We're, 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 we, we want to, in a sense, we want to grow in the options that we have to care for those who are, struck, who are struggling in sin. And, and, and there's more than one way. If, if in your pastoral care you only have one way to approach a particular problem, you're probably not going to approach it very well. Scripture, you know, wisdom is, is so multifaceted. There are a thousand ways we could approach any particular problem. That's, what, that's, that's why we're needy. That's why, Lord, help us, because there's no one way that is going to be the, the key to, to all of this. Here's something else. What is the opposite of, 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 of that particular sin? What is the opposite? What are we aiming for? To trust? To trust our God, not trust other people? To, to, make a, to take a stand against our desires? To, to be able to detect the, the work of the, the murderous work, the evil one? I'm just making different things up. Or here's the opposite. Love that that instead of trying to fight the enemy, has the enemy's interest even on our hearts. Um, you know, the, the, again, here, here there, there are all kinds of variations. What all I'm doing is I'm suggesting that in our care for sinners, we, we have to do something. We can't just say, oh, you know, I'm so sorry to hear this. We have to do something. And as we see the end of James, we recognize to be able to stand between sinners and death is a way to love them. How are we going to do such a thing? Uh, anger and yelling at the person doesn't seem to be, I don't know, I have never found that to be very helpful with anybody stuck in their own sins. So what do we do? We, as, as a general rule, we persuade. Listen, listen. This is, here's the truth. Well, when I just talked to you about this, the, this, this movement toward death, and there's two roads, and you're taking this path to death, you didn't say anything. Hold it. Did, did, you, hear, did, you, hear what, did you hear what we said? That, that you can't just ignore that one. That's, that's what, I want life for you, not death. Those are... those. As a general rule, what we're looking for is, 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 is to persuade with the person running into death as, as, as beautifully as we possibly can, to speak of our love for them, to, to speak of, of, of their misunderstandings 
of who God is, because here we go back to what we said before. You must not think that he is good. You must not. You see, see what I'm doing? I'm aiming directly at the very depths of the human heart as I'm talking about sin. You must not know him accurately. And could I pray this? Could I pray, along with the Apostle Paul, that we would know the expanse of the love of Christ? Could I simply pray that? In some ways, perhaps I'll put it this way. Um, when, When we can, we would like others to be surprised by the way we care for them. We want them to be surprised, not for the sake of surprising them, but God's ways are different than what we'd expect. <laughs> and, and, he, and his ways always sort of keep us a little bit off balance. They're just, they're better than we possibly could know. And, and we hope that, 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 that the truths of Christ, they, they're surprising to the person who seems to be comfortable in their own sins. How can can we speak about the God who, well, here's, I'll I'll leave you with this. Uh, I've thought about obedience a good bit recently and and, and how how the Lord says his, 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 you know, to obey him is not burdensome, but sometimes it's very hard. But one of the things that has helped me in my own obedience to Christ is to recognize that our obedience to Christ, it's not for the purpose of simply being obedient. It's for the purpose of closeness and nearness to our God. And the the illustration I think of occasionally is the illustration of marriage, where my wife and I obviously were committed to each other, but there are ways we both seek to be obedient to Christ as a way to grow in nearness. To lie to one another, what does it do? Even if my wife would never find out, it, it separates us. To speak the truth in love is to come together. And in my wife and I, we have all kinds of idiosyncratic laws as well. We have, we, well, one law is that if, if, if I have flown somewhere, I have to call her after I land. Now that's not a biblical rule, but, but it's a rule that if I violate it, it hurts the relationship. If I, if I do it, it brings closeness to the relationship. Our obedience is not simply to be obedient. Our obedience is to grow in Christ and, and have a relationship with our God that increasingly flourishes. Now, I'm not suggesting that our sin can can remove us from Christ. I'm not suggesting that. I am suggesting that if we are in Christ, our sin still does distance him, uh, distance us from him, and we're called to turn back to him. So all I'm saying in that now is, is, is how, I'm answering the question, and how do we peop- to talk to people who are stuck in sin? Well, sometimes we turn the lights on and we, we, how is it going, by the way? How is it going? Has this path been a fruitful one? Has it been a good one? Which is what? Trying to, try, trying to show how there are these, these, these indicators of death already along the way. Trying to just, just turn the lights on so someone can see. And then we're inviting them to turn. And, and you, could you imagine even saying something like this? I'm going to invite you sometime soon to turn to Jesus, but not today, but not today, because I don't think you're ready to turn to Jesus today. I think if you said you're going to turn, it would just be to make me happy. So, so we want to talk about, we want to talk about how turning to Jesus is irresistible, how it's, it's the desire, it's the new implanted desire of your heart. And so that's what we'll do. We'll talk about who Jesus is. We'll talk about how he he surprises you with his character and his love and his closeness. And, And then I'll keep inviting you. Are you ready to turn yet? Are you ready to turn? See, and I'm not giving you, and here's what we have to do in our in our pastoral care. I what I'm doing is is I'm saying, here's 
I think what all of us desire, we, we, there is this richness in the way that God pastors our souls. Sometimes, sometimes I, sometimes in the, in the midst of my own sin, it, it is, it is this, this dramatic intervention. Stop it! Stop it! And, and, and it, it just, it, it, it turns my life on a dime. Other times it's this, it's this gentleness. Um, do, you, do you have a reason to be afraid? Do you have, you know, or, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll do Jonah. And do you have, you have a good reason to be angry? Do you have, it is it, it, that God's very gentle care of Jonah's soul. Uh, do, you, do you have reasons to be angry? Do you have a right to be angry? What we're doing is we're, we're, seeking to, we're seeking to just sort of gather in some of those things that Scripture says. Let me pray. May we grow, Father. May we grow. May we consider, even today, uh, what, what is the one thing that, that you've put before us where we, we want to grow ourselves in, in turning to you in the midst of our difficulties. And when would you grow us in these things in such a way that, that we can be increasingly wise and increasingly loving in our day-to-day pastoral conversations and counsel. In the name of Jesus, amen.